Thank you so much. And the mic's working okay? Good morning and welcome to St. John's Presbyterian Church here in Toronto on Sunday, July the 2nd, 2023. We're um, delighted to have back with us this morning our music director, Mrs. Grace Han, and also for anybody watching online afterwards who does not uh, know me, I'm the Reverend Maureen Walter, the minister of the church. For thousands of years, this land has been the traditional home of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. It is still home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to work, live, and worship on this land. And as part of that gratitude, and because it is our national celebration as a country, we will stand and sing together the first verse of O Canada. It's in your hymn book at number 800, and you will notice uh, it has the official words. We, we, uh, the words the, in the hymn book predated the official, the official word change. And then we're only going to sing one verse, but you can look at the other beautiful words to the other verses. Please stand and join in singing O Canada. Our call to worship is printed in the bulletin. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Lord, you who ride on the wings of the wind, make the winds your messengers. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and enter our hearts. Let us worship God together. Our opening hymn is number 333, I Sing the Almighty Power of God, 333.
Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, we know that you are spirit, and those who worship you worship in spirit and in truth. And so we pray that you, you would open the world of the kingdom of heaven to our longing eyes, that we would see your grace, that we would know your love, that we would feel your blessings. We pray that your light and your truth would guide us, would bring us to your holy places, that we would know you love each one of us, and that you dwell within us, and that we are always able to find your altar. And so help us, Lord, to find your altar within our own hearts and souls, to know that you are the God of our joy and delight, our comfort and our peace. Help us always to feel your presence with us, and we ask that you would create a pure heart in each one of us, that you would give us a new and steadfast spirit, that we would be able to atone for whatever wrong we have done, that we would acknowledge your power over us, that when there are problems too large for us to handle, that we would trust in your strength and resolve to help us walk through them step by step, knowing that you are with us. In every way, Lord, help us to perform what you require, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with you, our Lord and our God. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. And be assured that in the mercy and love of God, we are a forgiven people. This day is a new day and a fresh start for each one of us. We're going to read responsively Psalm 13, 1, 3. Just, we'll just read it without the choir, whom we miss always. We won't try to sing any responses. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is taken from the book of Jeremiah. It would be handy if I opened the Bible instead of the book of praise. Uh, in the Pew Bible, this is on page 823, Jeremiah chapter 28, verses 5 to 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah replied to the prophet Hananiah before the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. He said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to this place from Babylon. Nevertheless, 
listen to what I have to say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. From early times, the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, and plague against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true. Amen. Julie Gangadine, one of our session members, will read our New Testament lessons. Good morning. Morning. Today's lesson is Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 23. And it can be found in your Pew Bibles on page 1182. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance, your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 10 verses 40 to 42. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And anyone who gives even a cup of cold water to the one of these little ones who is my disciple, 
Truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is number 328, This Is My Father's World. I remember when I was a very little girl, I went to a group called Explorers, and we sang This Is My Father's World every single Sunday. 328. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. While Jesus is in the midst of his public ministry, he sends the disciples to minister in the world, proclaiming the gospel to the people. Before they set out, he gives them instructions about how to conduct themselves and what they can expect. He says, whoever welcomes them welcomes him and will be rewarded for their kindness. Even those who do nothing more than offer a cup of cold water will be rewarded. The disciples knew there was a risk to proclaiming the good news to all. In those days, Israelites lived under Roman rule. Dissent of any kind was not allowed. The emperor was to be considered as a god. The key to survival was to obey the Roman 
law. Challenge the regime and expect a quick, brutal, and public death. The disciples knew the cost of promoting a religion other than the state religion. They knew witnessing to the good news could be risky. Jesus spoke words of reassurance to give them courage. It's an optimistic message of hopefulness. Jesus tells the disciples they will be supported. Though the disciples go into a harsh world, they will find God's love is demonstrated to them. Jesus talks to them as if they are diplomats on a royal mission. A diplomat carrying the insignia of the king will be welcomed by those who serve their master. Anyone who hopes to do business with the king will treat his diplomat with respect. Even in enemy territory, the diplomat will be protected. It is the way of the world. John Smith, the ordinary laborer, would not be received by governors and kings on his own behalf. However, that same John Smith arriving to represent the king would find all doors open. The disciples are conducting business on behalf of a monarch, the Lord God. Jesus tells the disciples, though they go into a harsh world, they will find sanctuary within it because they represent him. Jesus tells them they will know they are being received when they find kindness. If someone gives them a cup of cold water when they are thirsty, they are to recognize it as a sign of God's protection. The person will find their reward for their kindness. The disciple will know God's hand upon them. We disciples are the earthly representatives of Christ, and we proclaim the good news. Unlike those early disciples, we do not face retribution from the authorities when we spread the message of God. Yet, we still find ourselves worried or afraid of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Jesus does not tell the disciples to force anyone to change their practices and beliefs. He tells them to announce the good news, not enforce it. When people do not want to hear their message, they're to move on. They will know they are to stay and continue teaching when they are welcomed warmly. (laughs) <laughs> that reminds me of a conversation I had with my brother a few years ago who's worked with many governments in international literacy. And uh, I asked about a specific country where he had thought of working, and he said, oh, well, that government has no interest in public education. It's hard enough to do this job when the government wants your help and wants you to come in. That this just came to me a moment ago. That's kind of what Jesus is saying. It's going to be hard enough to do the job when you're wanted and welcomed. So if they don't want to hear you, there's lots of other people who do use your time there. And to know they're welcome, they're to notice the kindness done to them. Even small gestures have a message. This tells us many things. We share the good news, and we also hear it. 
At times in our life, we are hearing the message. At other times, we are sharing it. Whichever side of the equation we're on, we do right when we treat each other with kindness. We are community, the body of Christ gathered together to pray and serve the Lord. As the gathered body, people come to us. As the representatives of Christ, our challenge is to learn how to greet those who are strangers to us. Jesus said to welcome the prophet and the righteous, for they come in the name of the Lord. We're to listen with respect and treat the stranger with kindness, even reverence, for they could be a servant of Christ sent to bless us. We know we're supposed to welcome those special people, but what of everyone else? How do we know if they're righteous or not? Who do we welcome? Who do we give food when they're hunger or water when they thirst? It's a trick question. The answer is, we do not know who is a prophet and who is not. There is no way to tell that a person is a prophet or righteous, especially when we first meet. We do not know who the stranger is or what their credentials are. So we fall back on the instructions Jesus left us. Jesus tells us to welcome the prophet and the righteous, and he also tells us if we give a cup of cold water to the least of people, we will find our reward in heaven. The least of these are to be revered and treated with the kindness we would show a righteous person or a prophet. We are to offer food and water to all we meet. In other words, it's not our job to determine who is worthy of welcome. Rather, it is our job to welcome even the very humblest person. I'm instructed to offer a cup of cold water to one who is thirsty. That simple example of kindness tells me what I need to know. Water to the thirsty, food to the hungry, comfort to those who mourn, my job is to show God's love in the way I act. Some years ago, I was at a church conference, a big one, attended by many ministers and elders. The speaker told us, we must never think that we have visitors in our churches. His idea was that when people come to us, they're not visiting they're already part of the body of Christ, simply by their presence here among us. They're part of us, and we're to treat them as if they are ours. It's never a mistake to welcome the stranger and show them kindness as if they were a beloved brother or sister. We rely on God's teaching that God brings us to the people we need to meet, God is with us, and so we know what to do. Unfortunately, historically, people do not always welcome the stranger. History teaches us that we judge people based on the color of their skin, their facility with the language we speak, the kind of clothes they wear, or their sexuality. When we fail to welcome people on these or other grounds, we deny their humanity. We forget their children of God, beloved of God, sent to us so that we might learn from them or they might minister to us. They might be prophets. They might be righteous. Or they might be otherwise. Our job is not to decide. Our job is to find out if they're thirsty, and if they are, to offer them water. Every act of kindness preaches the good news. 
My mother first went into a Presbyterian church when she was four years old. I think yeah, I've told you this story before. Her older sisters, my grandmother would give each of the three girls a dime to put on the offering plate. And the two older sisters would drop my mother off at church and tell her not to tell on them. And then they took their dime and went and got ice cream. <laughs> One day, they dropped her off in front of the Presbyterian church. The next Sunday, they were going to drop her off in front of some different church. My mother was a stubborn kid. She would be stubborn all her life. And she said, no, the Presbyterian church was her church and that's the only church she was going to go to. Till the end of her life, from that first Sunday when she was four and walked into a Presbyterian church, she was Presbyterian. A couple of years ago, maybe three or four now, I asked her, what was so special about the Presbyterian church? What made her feel like they were her church? Was it their good theology? She certainly was theologically educated, by the end of her life anyway. Their amazing music, their delicious sandwiches. Why did that Presbyterian church become her church? Oh, she said, that first Sunday I went in, one of the ladies told me to come and sit with her. As simple as that, a lifetime connection began. Our smallest gesture of God's love is a proclamation loud and clear of the good news of the kingdom. We're to invite the stranger to sit with us. A few weeks ago, the son of one of my friends was on the subway. He noticed someone making rude comments to a woman on the same subway car wearing a hijab. He and his friend gestured and asked the woman to come and sit with them. She moved to sit with them and the harassment magically stopped. The harassers got out at the next stop. The woman simply sat there till it was her stop, but when she got up to leave, she expressed her gratitude when she got out. That's what it is to proclaim the gospel. We do not need to convert anyone to a different faith or determine if they're worthy of us. When the shoe is on the other foot, or it is us needing help, the kindness we meet is a sign that God goes with us even into difficult places. Last week, one of our dogs ran away. I don't know if you know, but our dogs are very tiny. One's four pounds and the other is three. When we, <clears throat> we didn't see her, hear her go. They were out in the backyard, which was enclosed. But when we looked for her, a couple of minutes after we'd let her into the backyard, she was nowhere to be found. As we looked around the yard and didn't find her, we began to realize she was gone. It was a terrible realization. We fanned out over the neighborhood with our flashlights, searching for her, calling her name, using our flashlights to try to see her in the dark. And people walked past, or biked past, or drove past. And they all stopped to ask, what were we looking for? We explained, we showed pictures, eventually Rick printed off flyers and put them up. Everyone who stopped to ask started to look for the dogs. The, just the one, one stayed home. Soon, at least 20 people, maybe more, were calling for her all over the area, driving slowly in their car, riding their bike, walking past, daisy, daisy, daisy. As the first 10 minutes stretched into an hour and beyond, I was sure our three pound dog would not survive. 
I confided my fear to a neighbor who came out. But she advised me not to give up hope so soon. Maybe somebody picked her up and she was safe. Her words refreshed my hopes and I stopped being so completely hopeless. A couple of hours later, a woman drove up to the house, parked her car in front. We were sitting on the front steps in case the dog came home on its own. And she said, I think someone found your dog. She showed us a post on one of those neighborhood apps, a little local neighbor group. And it was our dog, safe and sound in someone's house. We were able to connect over social media and go and get our dog. The rescuers had seen her running in busy traffic in a big intersection a full mile away from our house. They had been able to stop the car before they hit her, caught the dog, and took her to their home. We were grateful to everyone, and that's an understatement, and grateful to God. For a couple of hours, many strangers had all paused their own activities to help us. What does this tell me? So many people acted with kindness and love to help us, people we didn't know at all. It tells me we're not alone in this world. Whatever the situation, when we offer kindness, we offer God's love. When we are offered kindness, we are being shown God's love. Take every kindness as a sign of hope from God. Whatever we do for the least of these, we do for God. Nothing could be simpler, and nothing can be harder. With God's help, we serve. Amen. Our hymn is number 699, All the Way My Savior Leads Me.
Well, welcome everyone again. Thank you for being here on this holiday long weekend and despite all the uh, traffic construction, I was just handed moments before the service uh, another notice of uh, just for next weekend, um, July 8th and 9th, the Lakeshore Boulevard East will be closed between the Dawn uh, Roadway and Parliament Street. So if anybody is in the habit, I think the people who are aren't here today, but if they're watching online later, if you're in the habit of coming across on Lakeshore, check traffic routes for next Sunday. Um, I'll, we'll put this out so that anybody who's interested can look. Um, I am taking part of my vacation in July. I will be away later today and we'll start vacation and be away uh, uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Spears, our clerk of session, will take the worship service on the 9th and the 16th of July. Um, I don't think you people are as used to hearing or lead a service as I am when we were previously worshiping in the same church a few years ago uh, before we came here. Um, she often took a service and uh, I always uh, very much enjoyed, sometimes we did a service together and it's always fun, it's a, a different perspective but always very insightful and I found a lot out of it so I hope that you all enjoy that. Also, I'm pleased to tell you that the members of our congregation who we have been praying for all continue to recover well. Uh, Charlotte is recovering well, but is not yet at a point where she's ready to take services. Uh, we can all keep praying <laughs> for that because I, I completely love Charlotte's sermons. Um, also, while we are praying for people, uh, and I don't know if I'm supposed to share this, but uh, Grace, our organist, has just come back from uh, visiting with her mother in Japan. And her mother, we could all add Grace's mother into our prayer. She's suffering a long-term illness and uh, is hopefully going to be doing very well, but I, it would be wonderful if we all pray for Grace's mother and family as they um, all do their best to support her in this illness. Also, you could uh, keep my cousins, the Ralston family, in your prayers, the Bissett family, the Walter family. On the death last week, I may have mentioned it because it happened last Sunday morning, of um, my cousin Barbara Ralston, who was the oldest and last surviving member of my father's family. And we are going to be, uh, while I'm on vacation, part of what we're going to do is um, inter my mother's ashes and Barbara's ashes. They're in the same cemetery, so we're, we're going to do that on the same day. But it would be wonderful, two amazing, incredible, lifelong Presbyterians that we'll miss. Even if they weren't Presbyterian, we would miss them. <laughs> wonderful people. Uh, so that would be wonderful if you'd hold us in your prayers as well. Um, I've assured, told everybody, stay healthy for a couple of weeks. I'm not actually out of town that long. <laughs> but if you have a real pastoral emergency, you all know my cell phone number. Phone me, aside from Wednesday when we're in the cemetery. I'm on vacation, but we're in a spot that has more cell phone coverage. Or uh, phone Elizabeth Spears and we will uh, attempt to get whatever assistance you need. Um, but as a personal favor, I'd look on it kindly if you all stayed alive and healthy for a couple of weeks, and you online as well, please. Well, <laughs> sorry, that's kind of facetious. It's God's timing, not mine. But I think everybody's in okay shape at the moment. Life always carries surprises, so let us know if something changes. We do have a social hour in the uh, social suite room after the service. 
And we're all going to be praying for traveling ministry, uh, traveling mercies for Julie as she uh, goes on a vacation herself. But we're still through, thankfully to some of you people out there, we're going to um, continue to have our coffee hours even when Julie goes away. But we'll be thinking of you while you're gone. We had a very large gathering. I haven't had a chance to ask about it, but the uh, African congregations around the city, one of the lead ministers is connected very closely to the Presbyterian Church, studied at Knox College, uh, got his uh, various academic credentials there. And uh, they had a mass gathering here on Friday and Saturday. And generally there are a few hundred people at that. So that the church may look a little slim on the long weekend right now, but it, it's been full uh, all weekend long. So we'll be praying for those congregations as well and their ministry in the world. We don't pass the offering plate because of COVID. If you brought offering with you, you can put it on the plate. And in the prayer we're about to have, we'll give thanks for our offering. And I do thank everybody who continues to support us financially. Uh, it's, it is a major help to be able to, well, it's how we're able to carry on ministry. So thank you very much. It's deeply appreciated. Anybody who wants to make donations to Presbyterian World Service and Development, Ukrainian Relief, or Presbyterians Sharing, which is our joint uh, mission projects in Canada and around the world, please note that amount that you want to go to that specific purpose on the envelope and or whatever note you send, and uh, it will be divided that way. And if you want to... Um, go to pre-authorized remittance or electronic transfer of funds, please speak with our treasurer. Unless anybody has any other announcements. <coughs> our dear friend Eileen Best has moved into Nesbitt Lodge, which is at Pape and Danforth. Uh, she no longer lives in her house on Logan, and uh, she's there at Nesbitt Lodge, and uh, unless she's busy uh, going out with her children or taking part in activities, I think she is delighted to receive visitors. And I'm pretty sure Linda has some contact info if you want to know more exact details. Uh, yeah, that's uh, so. Uh, um, I haven't been up to see her yet, but uh, I understand that it is going well. Anything else? Then let's continue our service in prayer. Let us pray. Lord our God, source and giver of all good things, we thank you for all your mercies and for all your loving care over all creation. We thank you for the material gifts which you give to us that we are able to share with one another and with the world. We thank you for these offerings that we have received, and we pray that you would bless them and use them for your purposes, that your word might be known that your light might shine, that your love might be felt here and everywhere. We thank you for the gift of life, for your protection around us, your guiding hand upon us, your steadfast love within us. And we thank you for those small signs which you show to us each day of your presence within us and around us. We thank you for friendship and for duty, for hopes, for memories. We thank you for all those joyful things which cheer us up, for wonderful music which lightens our hearts, 
for works of art which help us to see beauty in all the world, for the joy of nature, the ability to walk among trees, around water, to see this wonderful creation that we are gifted with. <coughs> help us to find a way to live in this world that respects the needs of this earth. Help us to be responsible, that we would protect the climate, the environment, to do everything we can to heal this planet, which we have been blessed with, that we can live and work on it. Help us to treat the earth with such respect that it will be strong and healthy for centuries, generations to come. We thank you for the saving knowledge of your Son, our Savior, for the living presence of your Spirit, the Comforter, for the Church, the Body of Christ, which binds us together in all its great glory, in all the earth, and for all those witnesses by which we are compassed about, those who have gone on to your glory before us, especially those who guided us, who loved us, who raised us, and who continue to inspire us as we remember the things that they did in this earth. We thank you for all forms of ministry. And we thank you that each one of us are called to minister as your disciples, to proclaim the good news until you come again. In all our blessings, help us to use them to assist us in our growth and make life easier for those around us. Increase the beauty of life and bring more justice into this world. Just as you encourage the disciples, we pray that you would also give us courage to minister to you this day and every day, that we would live in love and that we would feel your blessing. Glory be to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall never end. And we continue to pray as we have been taught, saying, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, another old favorite, 744, Will Your Anchor Hold?
You are the people of God, the sheep of God's hand. Know that everywhere you go, God is with you. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Thank <laughs> you.